Jonathan Welton will be speaking tonight, and I just want to briefly just say um, I have the utmost of respect for him. Uh, I don't know him as well as I would like to, but just reading his books, hearing him, he spoke the last time he was here at uh, SSMA on the New Covenant, and it, I just want you to know it radically changed my life. And it didn't just change my life in the sense of it's a pretty idea. It opened up my spirit to a whole new realm, and he put something on Facebook uh, recently again that I thought was very powerful. He said the next Reformation is going to be one of the New Covenant. And we still in so many ways in the church haven't got the understanding of New Covenant and the power of it and what it means. And we still have these, you know, some of these old covenant ideas in our mind. Um, but the books that he's written, the teaching that he carries, meant we need men of God like Jonathan Welton. We need men of God like him in the church. We need teachers like him that, that hold the Bible to be the supreme authority. Not, not experience, not man-made ideology, not good feelings, not emotion, not philosophy, but the Word of God. And what he has to say, I trust, and, um, and I vote for him. <laughs> but really, um, I just I pray we give you, all of us just give him a warm welcome and give your heart and spirit uh, just opened up to listen to everything he has to say because you will be rocked. So. I should probably pray before I start. Lord, help these people. Amen. So good to be back with you. Um, how many of you have not heard me speak before? Wow. Well, I am very glad to have you here. I, I spoke to the ministry school and the Sunday morning services, and I know we have a lot of people, visitors from uh, even as far as Maryland and, I'm, and Texas. I expected Texas to be louder, but... Well, uh, I'm from Rochester, New York. I don't know, I might, I might have traveled the furthest to be here. And uh, I've been looking forward to this. Actually, I feel I feel real heavy weight tonight, and I, I know that we all feel, you know, the weight of, of presence that's that's in this room and, and been here, and um, you know, even through the internet, whoever's watching and, and listening right now, that you're probably sensing that presence too. And I, I feel a real weight, but it's more than just a weight of of his presence. There's There's something uniquely personal about tonight for myself, as well as I think what's going to take place this evening uh, in your life. Now, see, I, I've taken the last about three weeks off uh, off the road. I travel full time, speaking all over the country, and and uh, I've taken the last three weeks off the road because my wife uh, just delivered our first child. <laughs> So, the, uh, the, the sixth generation of, of Christian Welton is about being raised now, and Hannah Elizabeth Welton was born March 31st on Easter Sunday. Yeah, it's going to raise a lot of people from the dead. So, this is the first time I've gone out to speak. This is actually the first time I've spoken at the conference. It's the first time I've gone out to speak since she was born. Uh, back it up another another week before that, on March 26th, I had my birthday. I just turned 30, and woo, happy birthday to me, yeah. So, <laughs> and it's the first time I've spoken since then, and, and I, I don't know if you've ever looked at this, but for the Levites, and, you know, Jesus himself, of course, started his ministry at 30 years old, but it was required if you were a Levite, if you wanted to be in ministry, you had to be in ministry. You started at 30 years old. And so there was this time period where you would begin your ministry at 30 and you could minister until you were 50. So you had a window of time. And the Lord's really been putting that, that on my heart that this next 20 years, we're going to see some tremendous stuff take place, that I've already been traveling and ministering and writing books and, and doing all that, but there's just something 
significant about this next season. And the, and the last few places I went, I was in uh, Delaware in early March, and I was with one of my heroes, my one of my absolute most favorite people in the, the world, a minister named Harold Eberly, and he's been a spiritual father to my wife and I. He's, he's a tremendous theologian, and he is um, just a, a father in our life, and, and he and I ministered side by side at this, this conference, which was just a great honor for me. And I, I realized walking away from that, one of the last times I spoke before my birthday, before my daughter was born, that the next time I speak, I'm now speaking as a father. And I think that's tremendously significant. This is the first time I get to speak as a father. I'm not going to talk about, you know, fathering and all the great revelations I've had in two weeks of being one. <laughs> That's not where I'm going tonight. But I, 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 I've had a lot of words put over my life in the sense of being called as a seer, being called as a prophet, being called as a revivalist and a supernaturalist and all these different terms. The one that's really struck in my heart is that I sat down with a friend who did some consulting with me last summer, and he said, you know, what is the passion of your heart? And I said, I want to change the church for the next 500 years. I don't want my children to grow up in church the way it was as I grew up in it. That's not okay with me. And we're, we're at a place where there's a lot of voices of fear and concern there's a lot of voices that are looking at the world right now. They're disappointed in, in the church. They're disappointed in our uh, politicians, our government. They're disappointed in so many things. And there's, there's a fear. That's the, the level of fear-mongering is just hitting a high tide right now. And it's into that that we need some voices of, of courage and of hope, some voices of, of truth that are going to address the reality of what God is really doing. Because God is not scared. I, have, I was surprised earlier today, I, I posted, I said, if you could, I posted on the internet, if you could be alive at any time in history, what time would you want to be alive and why? And I was happily surprised to find over 75% over of the people that responded said, I am glad to be alive right now. That's so encouraging. It's, it's not time to be pining for, you know, going back to Azusa Street or pining for some other move of God. If we're doing that, we're not aware of what's really going on right now. And, and Josh already went right to the punch. I really do believe, and this is what I want to declare tonight as a father is that we are entering right now this new reformation, and I'm declaring it in the Spirit. I am declaring and I am speaking it out to all those in my voice and to all those who carry this beyond my voice. We are in a reformation. This is not time for harbingers. This is not time to get scared. This is not time to be a coward. This is a time for reformation. This is time right now for the King, the Kingdom, and the New Covenant. Those are the three words that I'm really going to get into tonight, and those are the three words that I believe we've been leading into in this move. See, for a long time, the gospel has been preached, and, and it's been preached as Jesus is the king, and that's absolutely true. And in the last move that's been going on, it's moved just from just the plain gospel to now the full gospel, and we've been walking in the understanding of the kingdom of God. We've been hearing about that, and it's been taught, it's been taught, it's been taught. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. How many of you have heard where to pray that it would be on earth as it is in heaven? I mean, that's for our movement, that's almost like a WWJD bracelet. That's, that's our thing, and we've come to understand that, that if there's no sickness in heaven, there should not be any in the earth. And as an ambassador, as a citizen of heaven, I go enforce the law that says no to sickness. There are no demons in heaven. There shouldn't be any in you. And we've been 
going after this. We've been going after this kingdom thing, but one of the pieces that's still missing is the new covenant. And I'm going to hammer this tonight because that is something we have to understand. Because like Josh said, it, it impacted, transformed his life. The new covenant is going to be the missing piece for the body of Christ. That's going to take us forward into the next phase is what the Lord is doing in the earth. Now, there's, there's so many things you could teach about. You could talk about spiritual warfare. You could talk about identity. You could talk about grace. You could talk about, you know, just... You know, all the different things that can be talked about. But if we were really to look at the big picture, we have to understand the king, the kingdom, and the new covenant. Those are the pillars. Those are the foundations of understanding biblical Christianity, understanding New Testament Christianity. What you saw tonight, and I even heard one of, one of the people that got up and shared and testified, they said, you know, I've never, I've never seen anything like this. What you saw tonight should not be an exception in any way. This, this is not a, a once in a while thing. See, some would look at this and go, we just had a revival service. We just had what the New Testament calls normal Christianity. See, I've been brushing up on my southern, getting ready to come back here. So I, I just, I'll say it this way. I think we ought to be fixing to just have a revival. I know sometimes people just put out a sandwich board sign in front of their church and say, you know, the next three days we're going to have revival. And then it'll end, basically, which means we have a guest speaker to coming to town. Like, we're having a revival this weekend, and then it will leave. And there's other churches we just wait, and we fast, and we pray, and we have, you know, umpteen hundreds and thousands of hours in prayer for a revival to someday come out of the sky. I just wonder if we just had one. What, why don't we just have one? It's not as many amens as there should be but you're probably still thinking it through. We can just have one. I, I traveled with Randy Clark for a whole bunch of years. We were on staff for three years. We interned before that, my, my wife and I, and uh, we, we've, he's the one who launched the Toronto Revival that went for over 10 years, six nights a week, and, and just tremendous, tremendous move of God. And we've seen incredible, incredible things. And having studied revivals and having studied revivalists, I've come to understand that those that we lift up on, on pedestals, whether it's Charles Finney or whether it's Smith Wigglesworth or John G. Lake, they had this perspective that just said, let's just have one. They didn't go and look for the place with the open heaven. They believed heaven was open over them. <laughs> Charles Finney his denomination, he was a Presbyterian, and when he came to Rochester, New York, my hometown, he came into town and he sat down with the Presbyterians of his denomination and he said, I believe God is going to move here. And they said, well, God will move here when God's ready to move here, because when this sovereign God sovereignly chooses to so move here in his sovereignty, sovereign, sovereign, sovereignness, he'll move here. And Finney said, no, God will move because I'm here. That was in June of 1830. By March of 1831, nine months later, Charles Finney had had 100,000 salvations. Over 90% of Rochester and upstate New York region had turned to the Lord. The newspapers referred to the section as the burned over district, meaning that it was almost like this religious fire hanging in the air when you went to the upstate New York region. And everybody, all those Presbyterian pastors who had stood against him originally and didn't allow him to come in and do meetings there and so forth actually were all ministering under Finney as they came and repented for their wrong understanding. 
God is looking for someone that through relationship and an understanding of their identity and their place in the earth that he can partner with to open and release heaven fully into this planet. There's, there's so much more that's available to us that there's no reason to sit back and wait for something to happen. Why don't you happen? Finney didn't even come in and set up some giant tent and just start, you know, putting together something. What he really started doing was he came in and they were digging the Erie Canal across upstate New York. And he went down to the miners and he began to preach to them. And he started getting all these miners that were getting saved that were digging out the canals. He went to the local canning factory and he would walk through the canning factory without saying a word. And as he would walk through the canning factory, row after row of the women working on the, on the, in the cannery would begin weeping because of the presence of the Lord. The, the leaders of the factory just said, we need to just shut the factory when Finney comes through because it's more important that people get their soul right with God than that we make cans this week. See, this, we, we've, we've got a, a picture of the kingdom that we've started to open ourselves up to. Maybe you came up in some sort of background that didn't believe in the supernatural, and now you've stepped into it, and it's incredible, and it's exciting. But it by itself is is incredible and exciting and the kingdom and you can go after it but without the foundation of the new covenant it leaves a lot of unanswered questions and it leaves you with some insecurity because then the question arises well why didn't that person get healed or why did that tragedy happen or why does this happen and that happen and all those unanswered questions are answered by the other pillar and we've stepped into pursuing the kingdom of god bringing heaven into the earth but this other piece, this new covenant, is going to, it's going to revolutionize your identity and your understanding of God. See, one of the biggest messages, I, I know uh, with Bethel and Redding that, that Bill Johnson talks about, he gets the most trouble for saying that God is good all the time. That right there is actually the message that he says gets him in the most trouble. And the reason being is because people don't really know or believe or trust or understand that God is good all the time. What about when a giant hurricane happens? What about when a tornado destroys your home? Maybe you're being judged. Maybe it's because you, you know, were angry at that person while you were driving. Maybe, you know, there's those questions that creep in and the kingdom doesn't answer those questions. The supernatural doesn't answer those questions. But covenant does. And we've been wondering for far too long, is God okay with us? Is America making him angry? Do you see what I'm saying? Are we bothering him too much here? Did we not give enough in the offering? That was a joke, actually. That was. But there's, there's honestly these questions that remain for people, and I think it's important that we answer some of these, that we settle some of these issues in our heart. We're going to go a little bit deep tonight, and I won't lose you. I, it's my goal to keep, keep us together here, but we're going to go a little deep. You guys ready? When I say Old Covenant, I'm not referring to the Old Testament. See, you've heard me refer several times to this thing called the New Covenant. The New Covenant is not the New Testament. The Old Covenant is not the Old Testament. This is an important difference because if you do not understand the difference, for most Christians, we live our life with this book that we are supposed to read every day, and if you don't, you feel guilty. Right? You do realize that before the Gutenberg press, people didn't have daily devotions where they read their Bible because people didn't have a Bible. I don't know if you ever thought about that because the, the concept that's creeped in for so many is that, oh, I didn't read my Bible today. God must be angry at me. 
you know, for the first 1,500 years of Christianity, they weren't reading this every day the way that we do now. You should read it because it is a joy and an honor and a privilege. People died to get this in your hands. People were burned at the stake for, for getting this into your hands. I read this with a thrill, not out of a guilt, a condemnation, or some sort of responsibility or liability. Just a little side note. So when I, most Christians, though, they approach this book and they look at it through this lens there, they say, well... Um, my understanding is that the New Covenant is the New Testament, which means that about this much of the book applies to me. And then this is the Old Testament, that's the Old Covenant. I don't have a clue what to do with that. I, I don't know if you've ever talked to an atheist before. I just don't know if you have or not. But a lot of them have a real problem with our understanding of Christianity where we say God is always good or God is love. And they go, did you read this part? And there's a lot of misunderstandings. And there are some very, very clever, clever atheists out there who've written books and they, the YouTube videos that have been made that are just incredibly clever. And most Christians don't even know how to respond or answer these accusations where they say, well, you know, if he's so good, why doesn't he condemn slavery? He just kind of puts a few rules around it in the book of Leviticus. Why, why does he allow, you know, if, if a virgin gets raped, why does, you know, the guy get to marry her? That seems completely out of place. There's just a lot of questions. Have you ever had any of those questions? I don't know if you've read back on this section of it, but it can leave you with some question marks. I'm not going to go into every single one of them, but I will explain if you understand covenant, this makes sense. And there are people who are in what is called nowadays the grace movement who've been trying to respond to this. And without understanding covenant, it's really hard to answer those questions. So the old covenant is not the Old Testament. When I say that the new covenant has replaced the old covenant, I'm not saying the New Testament has replaced the Old Testament. That's important to note. I'll repeat it. If the New Covenants replace the Old Covenant, that does not mean the New Testament has replaced the Old Testament. You got it? Good class. So, the Old Covenant did not exist until Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 20. What's referred to as the Old Covenant, the writer of Hebrews refers to the Old Covenant as the covenant that happened with the Ten Commandments on the mountain with God, Mount Sinai, in Exodus chapter 20. That's the Old Covenant. Which means that in the Garden of Eden, there was no Old Covenant. Before the flood, there's no Old Covenant. Abraham had no Old Covenant. There's no Old Covenant until you get outside of Egypt to Mount Sinai and God comes and visits and an Old Covenant is then created. Let me back the story up a little bit. A covenant, we have to understand what is a covenant. A covenant is a, it's a form of how people relate to each other. So let me take an example here. Um, uh, I'm just going to take Philip. Come on up here for a minute. And just stand here for a moment. So the concept of covenant is this. There's actually three different types of covenant that existed in the ancient Near East. The ancient Near East had three different types of covenants. The first type of covenant was called a a vessel covenant, or also a suzerain covenant. It meant that the covenant was between a greater king and a lesser king. Now, in that case, the greater king would put obligations on the lesser king, saying, you have to follow all of these rules and be obedient, or else I'm going to come and destroy you and your people. It's kind of rough. That would happen in the case of uh, you know, a, a greater king, a greater army, a greater nation that's saying, I want peace with you so that you give me tax money rather than I come in and kill you all. Otherwise, these are your options. 
you give me a bunch of sheep, we'll get along just fine, I won't have to kill you. So that's option number one. We'll call it a king treaty. So the king treaty is option number one. Option number two was a partnership covenant where you had two equals that would come together. With two equals coming together, they would say, I will stand with you against the enemy, you stand with me. If I have trouble, uh, you'll back me. If, if you have trouble, I'll back you. And so there's, there's a partnership agreement on equal standing with each other. The third option was called a grant covenant. A grant covenant would be a greater king so loved a lesser king and thought that he was so wonderful and amazing that he just wanted to give him a grant. Like when the government says, I just want to give you free money for whatever reason, you know, it's a great way to get a vote. And they want to give you free money for something. It's a grant. That's the concept. And so when we look in scripture, we have all three types of covenants. But since we're reading it almost 4,000 years later, on the other side of the planet, we kind of miss some of this. I'm going to call you back up in a few minutes. I'll let you sit. Thank you. So here, here's the concept. Noah was given a grant covenant. When God came to Noah, Noah was the only righteous person left on planet Earth at the moment. You remember that, right? So everybody's falling away. Everybody's doing some horrible stuff. He comes to Noah and he says, Noah, you're awesome. Let's build a boat together. And I'm going to make a covenant with you. And now after the flood, after the whole thing is all said and done, he makes a covenant with Noah and he says, I'm going to put a rainbow in the sky as the sign of the covenant and I'll never flood the earth again in that way, in that manner. I'll never do that again. That was a grant covenant. Noah didn't have to do something to uphold his end of the deal. You got it? The grant covenant is a gift from a greater to a lesser, and it comes with no strings attached. So, you get to Abraham, and God is pleased with Abraham in the same way he was pleased with Noah. And he says, Abraham, I want to bless you. I want to make, your, I want to make you a great nation. I want to bless all the peoples of the earth through you, and I want to make your name great. Why? Because Abraham, he got up when God talked to him. He left his father's home. He went out to a place not knowing where he was going, and he followed the Lord's leading. And that led the Lord to want to give him a grant covenant. Abraham, I'm pleased with you. I'm going to make a covenant with you. These are the things I'm going to bless you with. And he gives it to him. When David takes the, the kingship, it's in 2 Samuel chapter 7, David has this thing enter his heart because he's such a passionate man after worship that he says to the Lord, I want to build. I want to build a temple for you, Lord. And I, you know, I, just, I just love how my, my perspective of what the Lord is thinking here, like, oh, David, that's so cute. Like, I love you too, David. Thank you. Because he responds and he's like, well, I don't live in houses built by human hands. Like, that's really cute. But like, I made you. Like, you know, that's so sweet that you'd want to build me a house. But, you know, you know, I, I, you know, one other thing, David, is that your hands are covered with blood. You're like a man of war. And I don't really want to like have that be a temple built by hands covered in blood. So how about we do this? your son can make a temple for me, which was Solomon's temple. And then God turns around out of that same love that David just demonstrated to God even. God now is responding going, I'm going to build you a house, David. And he promises to David, I will build an eternal throne and you will have a descendant that will sit on that throne for all time. Uh, I hear some light bulbs clicking on here. Oh, Jesus, yes. Yes, some of you scholars have gotten ahead of me. <laughs> so we have these grant covenants, but right in the middle of this whole weird thing is the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant. 
So Noah's got this great deal like God's saying, I'll never do that again. And I'll put pretty rainbows in the sky. Awesome. Cool covenant. And then Abraham, he's like, Abraham, you lay down and go to sleep. And then I'm going to have a torch and a furnace. And we're going to have this whole amazing thing happen in Genesis 12 and 15 and 17 and 22. And so he's got this, this whole covenant that he gets with God. And he's going to bless all the nations of the earth and bless all the peoples and give them a great name. So that's amazing. And then David, he's going to have a, an eternal inheritance, a, a son that's on the throne for all time. But then there's this other covenant. See, the old covenant was this. When Mount Sinai happened, and this has been the misunderstanding of the church for a long time. See, when God came in, in, in Exodus chapter 20, and he shows up on the mountain, he says, I want you to be a nation or a kingdom of priests. It was never God's heart or intention to have the Levite priesthood. I don't know if you ever noticed that. He wanted a kingdom and a nation of priests, which means I want direct relationship. The priest had direct relationship with God. God shows up on the mountain and says, I want the whole nation. Every single one of you will be a priest, meaning every single one of you will have direct access to me. I want direct relationship with all of my people. And the people said, let Moses go talk to him and let him not speak to us again because we're scared that we'll die. And the people reject God. And the people say, Moses, you go tell him to give us the rules and whatever he says, we'll obey. Whatever he says, we'll follow the rules. Just go get the rule book and don't let him talk to us anymore. And so a brokenhearted father creates the old covenant. An old covenant that he doesn't want. An old covenant that he didn't intend. An old covenant that, that he knew, I'm going to replace this at some point but we're going to have to do this old covenant thing for a while because they just rejected me. So there's this process now where the people have pushed God away and God says, all right, I'll give you that kind of covenant. And so it switches. And rather than being a grant covenant, I'll be your God, you'll be my people, and I'll have direct relationship with every single one of you. Instead of that, We'll do the rule book and we'll have a partnership covenant where, where God says, instead of me just giving you a grant covenant and blessing you, we'll do an, an, an equality thing where I'll come down to your level and I'll, I'll give you a covenant. And the first covenant that they were given was the Ten Commandments. And we don't think of the Ten Commandments as the covenant because, as I said earlier, we're 4,000 years late and we live on the other side of the planet. We don't understand covenants very well. So, for example, this is what we think of what, 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 what do you think you see here? Ten Commandments, right? That's the Ten Commandments. That's what Charlton Heston carried down. <laughs> Yet it's probably not like that at all. It's not at all what the Ten Commandments look like. Um, for one, uh, we get the clue that in Exodus 32, verse 15, it says that they were inscribed on both sides. There were two tablets, and they were inscribed on both sides. That's important. So we have two tablets. Based on the time period of the ancient Near East, what we most likely have is a square tablet and another square tablet. And these would have been inscribed on both sides. Now, what's the point here? The concept is when you'd make a covenant, you would write up the terms of the covenant, and you would always make two copies. 
This is not rule 1 through 5 and 6 through 10. This is 1 through 10 and 1 through 10. It's their duplicate copies. That's what's going on here. They would make two copies, and then here's what would happen. I'll have my assistant come back. Would you join me? Whoa. I'm hoping that wasn't a guy. Um, so here's what we got going on. If you want to do this kind of covenant, we'd say, okay, we're going to have a partnership covenant. We're going to have equals here, which means that we make up our terms of our covenant, and then we're going to make two copies. And so you get a copy of the covenant. There you go. And I have a copy of the covenant. Now, let's say that um, you're going to be an Israelite. I'll be a Hivite. Well, just, yeah, whatever. So you're an Israelite. I'm a Hivite. We probably shouldn't be in a covenant because that would violate some rules, but we're going to just say that we made one. And so you turn around, you're going that way, I'm going this way. Now, I would take my copy of the covenant back to my nation, and what I would do is I would put it in the temple of my God. He would take it and put it in the temple of his God. Now, this gets a little interesting because now the thought is, now that I have this covenant contract with this other nation, what I'm saying is that if I break this covenant contract against you, it sits in the temple of my God, and my God will punish me. Did you get that? So, if I break my agreement with you, I have my copy sitting in my temple, and my little God is going to punish me and my nation. If you break the covenant against me, your God will punish you. And so that was what would happen in a normal situation. But this is where it gets interesting. Because God is coming down, and so you got Moses and the nation of Israel, and God is coming down and saying, we will create an equality covenant together. Um, hmm. But since I'm your God, I don't have a God that can punish me. So here's what we'll do. We'll make two copies, and we'll put it in the temple of your God, which is me. And we'll put that in your temple, in the tabernacle. And if I violate it, I've put my word above my name. You ever heard that phrase before? It's in Psalms. I, he puts his word above his name. His word being, I promise to fulfill my end of the covenant. His name is his being. He's putting his covenant promise above who he is and saying, if I violate my promise to you, I will fulfill both parts of this and I'll be the one that takes care of my problem here. He's saying he swore an oath to himself by himself because there was no one greater to swear an oath by. As it's in the writer, the writer of Hebrews brings that out as well. He had to swear the oath by himself because there was no one else to swear it by. Every man be proven a liar, but God is true. So he sets this whole system up. And the concept here now is that he is going to come in and he's going to watch over them and he's going to watch over him and he's going to watch over his word to fulfill all his promises. Now, when you read the Ten Commandments, these are not just simply rules, but these are actually, if, if he's entering in as the king to another king, he's saying, you can't have other gods before me. This is not a, uh, a, an insecure God. This is a king saying, you don't make treaties with other kings. You have a treaty with me. You and I have a relationship. You can't go out there and, and have other relationships. We're having a relationship. I, it's, it's the same as a marriage. It's the same concept. And so he's saying, and that's why the picture of idolatry and adultery always show up together. The concept was if you were putting another God in there, it's as if you're violating a marriage relationship. You're bringing in another outside person. That's why he couldn't make covenants with other nations. So this concept is, is he puts this contract in place. 
Now, some of the one, some of these Ten Commandments almost seem kind of weird if you really think about it. Like, it, there's a few that are great, obvious, like, uh, don't kill people. Okay, that's a good one. But why would you say don't kill people, and then on par with that, you better take a day off? Like, your Sabbath. Like, like I don't know that those are on the same footing. Don't kill people, you better take a day off. No, here's what's going on. They just came out from under Pharaoh as slaves. And under Pharaoh as slaves, they had to work seven days a week. And God, who's now making this contract with them, has already started to introduce grace. He puts it right in there and he says, I want you to understand I will be your God, but I will not be like your Pharaoh. I will not be like that Pharaoh who worked you seven days a week. I will be your God who institutes in your covenant, you have a day off. Man wasn't made for Sabbath. Sabbath was made for man. So God is giving them a gift. He's giving them, look, I am putting it right up front. I want you to be a people of rest with me. And from there, he moves into giving them manna, and now he's just feeding them. The Pharaoh they were just under started to take their straw away to make their brick making harder. He was making everything harder progressively. God's like, you want quail? We'll give you quail till it comes out your nose. He says that in Psalms. So he gives them these things. It's a God of grace that's now introducing things. So this, this is a whole different understanding of, of what the Ten Commandments were. Now it started to shift though, and I'll... I'll I'll keep you up here for another minute. So the concept started to shift because this first generation comes out from under Pharaoh. They make this covenant with God. They reject God. They just give us the rules. So he says, okay, I can't give you a grant covenant where we have direct relationship. You've rejected that. So I'll, I'll do the next best thing and we'll do this equality covenant. And we'll make, I'll make it as great as I can for you. I'm going to give you a day off and I'm going to just basically tell you not to kill each other and don't lie to each other and don't rob each other and don't make covenants with other gods. All right, good. So now we're moving forward. And that first 40 years, that first generation dies off in the wilderness. As they're dying off, it's just complaint after complaint and unbelief and, and uh, lack of faith and just problem after problem where they are turning on this covenant. See, one of the things that really happened when, when Moses comes down the first time with the first set of the two copies, he doesn't even finish getting down the mountain and the people are already worshiping the golden calf. And he smashes the copies, which to us seems like, ah, oh, there's Moses' anger problem. It's just, you know, just another picture of it. He's hitting rocks and he's, he's breaking tablets and you know he's doing this whole thing but that's actually what you would do when you violated a covenant you would take those covenant contracts and you would break them to signify you have broken this covenant so he destroys it and then he says who's on the side of the Lord and the Levites step forward and say we're with you Moses let's let's we'll do whatever you tell us to do and he says go through the camp and kill and so the Lord says, stop. And so they are just wiping people out, these, these idol worshipers that have stirred up this whole thing. And I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but on the day that the law was given, 3,000 people died. How many people got saved on the day of Pentecost? There's a lot of types and shadows going on here. On the day the law was given, 3,000 people died. On the day the Spirit was given, 3,000 people were brought to life. So that's the first set of the ten. He goes back up, he comes back down with the second set, and now the Levites are set aside as these ones are going to be God's priests. Now it was never God's original intention, but those were the ones who proved faithful. He'll walk with them during the time of the Old Covenant. So he begins to walk out this Old Covenant. They spend 40 years in the wilderness. That generation dies off. And now Moses is an old man. He is now close to 
uh, close to 120 years old. He's going to die soon. He has to pass the whole thing to Joshua. And that's what the book of Deuteronomy is. The book of Deuteronomy, which is filled with all of those wild and weird and wacky and confusing laws that people go, well, what about this? And what about that? And what about that? The book of Deuteronomy, which Deuteronomy means the book of the law, that book of the law was a renewal of the covenant that they had made on the mountain years before. If you look at this carefully, in Exodus 20, when God first came and spoke to them, the whole nation heard the voice of God speaking from the mountain. When the people rejected, they never heard God audibly as a nation again. From then on, it was Moses who would come down and speak on behalf of God. But they didn't hear God in the same way. So now jo Moses is about to die and he's going to pass the whole deal over to Joshua. So he's going to do a renewal of the covenant with the people. Except this time, because the, peop the people in their hearts just wandered so far away from God, now he's approaching it saying, I'm going to renew this, but from here forward, it's going to be a king covenant, not an equality covenant. And it shifts from here's 10 basic rules to here's a book of law. Because you are trying to uphold it, I'll give you the extra rules and you can try. You wanted this, here you go. And so it shifts even more as the people have wandered, not just for 40 years, but they've literally wandered further and further in their hearts away from God. So he gives them the book of the law so that they can continue to try and do their thing their own way, the way that they wanted. And you know the interesting thing about that, there's a lot of accusation of, you know, well, why didn't God just end slavery? Why did he allow for rules? And why did he allow this? And why did he, you know, only give certain amount? Because even in that moment of him giving the law, grace was still there. Here's, here's what I mean by that. He says in, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, uh, chapter 30, verse 11, he says, I placed the law within your reach. I didn't place it up in heaven where you couldn't get to it. God brought the law all the way down to the horrible society that they were living in at the time and said, I'm going to give you rules, but they're not my best. They're not my new covenant. They're not my ideal this law won't take you back to the Garden of Eden. This law is just going to be barely within your reach and you're still going to be miserable failures at trying to keep it. But I'm just trying to put it within reach. I'm not trying to give you my best because my best would be direct relationship. So he gives them just, just like, just try to do this, guys. You know, don't kill each other. Don't lie to each other. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal from each other. I will give you some really basic stuff that's within reach. It's not like that hard not to kill people. So he puts it within reach. He doesn't put it up at the perfect ideal. So he puts it within reach for them, and they continue to try to walk this thing out. And it is a miserable failure year after year after year. And by the time you get to Jeremiah and Ezekiel, they are now speaking of a new covenant. In Jeremiah 31, he speaks of a new covenant. He says, I will make a new covenant with them. It will be nothing like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. I'll write my law in their hearts. I'll give them a new mind. I'll put my spirit within them. In Ezekiel 36, he talks about taking out a heart of stone and putting a heart of flesh within them. He's saying, I'm going to just revamp the whole system. I'm going to take out their brain. I'm going to take out their heart. I'm going to put a new spirit in them. It's a total strip down and start over as a people. And he says, this is what is coming. A new covenant that will do away with the old covenant. I'll let you go. Thank you. All right. So, other than a seminary level explanation of the old covenants of the Old Testament, what's your point? 
My point is, if you don't understand these pictures, you won't understand what was given to you as an inheritance of the new covenant. See, we talk about new covenant, and we think of old covenant. We think of Moses. We think of Noah. We think, we think of them, and we kind of throw them all in a box, and we go, that's the covenant. No, these were very different. And the covenant that God didn't want was the one that he had to create that the people called for, and out of his love and mercy, he gave them a chance and gave them that covenant for a time. And when we get to the New Testament, Paul, this tremendous scholar and writer, he speaks in Galatians chapter 3 and 4, and he talks about the old and the new covenants. He, he gives these different pictures, and one of them he says that Isaac was the child of promise, and he's the new covenant. And that Ishmael, the son of Hagar, the bondwoman, the slave woman, that's the old covenant. And he's appealing to the Galatians, and he says, Galatians, throw out Ishmael and Hagar and that old bond servant, that slave woman, throw out that old covenant. I think the number one thing that keeps the church from being vibrant and healthy and attractive and bringing people in, bringing in the lost, bringing in the move of God is a mixture of old and new covenant. And you may not even realize that you've been walking in that, maybe for decades. We, we talk about nowadays the spirit of religion, legalism, bondage, uh, traditions of men. We talk about those, and that's what I'm hinting at here, but it's a mixture between Old Covenant and New Covenant. And it leads us to not understand our current relationship with God. Our current relationship with God is the New Covenant. You say, okay, well then what, what is this New Covenant? Where did it come into the timeline? So Jesus is born in a manger. Eight pounds, six ounces, golden manger. So Jesus is born in a manger. If you didn't get it, don't ask your neighbor. So, so he's born in a manger. Here he is. King of glory has arrived, but the new covenant has not. He begins to minister. He says, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God has arrived, but the new covenant has not. We don't even hear mention of the New Covenant until the Last Supper. There is not one mention of the New Covenant until the Last Supper. At the Last Supper, Jesus stands up and he says, this is the blood of my New Covenant made with many for the forgiveness of sins. That's the first mention. And interestingly enough, he doesn't tell them diddly about it. He tells them nothing. If you're about to make a covenant with someone, you would need to know the terms. And Jesus says, I'm about to make a new covenant. And goes on with his meal. Uh, okay, Jesus, what you doing? Don't worry about it. I'm about to make a new covenant. See, the thing is, he didn't make a covenant with them. And this may be a challenging statement, probably is, and you'll probably just need to hang on for a few minutes before you start posting about me on the internet. Um, I will explain this if you hang on with me, but you don't have a covenant with God. That is a big misunderstanding in the church where we think we have a covenant with God. Jesus has a covenant with the Father, and you get to be inside Jesus. Remember all the passages where Paul said, you and your covenant with God? Or where Peter said, or Jude, or James, or... Right, there, there is none, uh, for those who are racking your brain right now. There is no place that they talk about your covenant with God because you don't have a covenant with God. Jesus has a covenant with God the Father. So you can't screw it up. So if you read through the book of Hebrews, especially chapters 8, 9, and 10, 
That could be homework for you. Hebrews 8, 9, and 10, what you begin to see is that God the Father stands on one side of the new covenant, and Jesus the Son stands as the high priest of humanity. And as the high priest of humanity, he, as the high priest like Moses would have been, he makes a new covenant with God the Father. And because they want this to be perfect, they don't just use a sheep. Jesus also becomes the third part of this covenant. He's, you have God the Father, Jesus the Son, and Jesus the sheep. And Jesus is doing two-thirds of this covenant all by himself. He is both the recipient of the covenant and all the promises, and he is also the blood that seals the covenant. So it says in, in Hebrews 8 and in Hebrews 9, it speaks of how he as the high priest took his own blood behind the veil of the heavenly tabernacle and put it on the mercy seat in heaven. Moses couldn't do that. Moses didn't take his own blood. He took the blood of an animal. Jesus took his own blood and went behind the mercy seat, behind the the. the the veil to the mercy seat in heaven and put it on the altar. So Jesus is fulfilling this side of it. Now this changes things quite a bit because now the question is, what about humanity? Do they have a covenant with God? No. Jesus has a covenant with God. Now the question is, are you in Jesus? Our salvation message has been messed up because we've been trying to tell people, one, you have to realize that you're filthy, awful, depraved, totally depraved, sinner, garbage, scum of the earth. Once you realize what trash you are, then you'll realize that God has such love and grace and mercy that even though you're a piece of garbage, he was willing to die for you. That's, that's theologically what people do teach, and they believe that. You know, yet he says that all those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Those who believe that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, they'll be saved. But aren't they supposed to know how horrible they are first? And then once they got that figured out, then God can forgive them. Then they can be in a covenant with him. See, we've added a lot of things that it doesn't say. See, for example, uh, there's a lot of ministers and ministries that do like uh, emotional inner healing. And they talk about, you know, one of the reasons you might not be healed is because if you don't forgive that person, God can't forgive you. You remember that one? Except something changed at the cross. See, can, is God's hands are God's hands really tied by the fact that you haven't forgiven someone? If that is still true, then we don't understand the cross properly. Because by the time we get to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. So why do I forgive other people? so that God will forgive me? Or after the cross, I forgive other people because God forgave me. There are some massive changes that happen, and we've mixed our theologies of old and new covenants, and we still go around saying, well, you know, maybe the reason you're still sick is because you have unforgiveness in your heart. And so God can't forgive you. You tied his hands with your unforgiveness. You don't have that power over him. I'm sorry. Here's the reality. The reality is this. God forgave once for all. That blood on the mercy seat covers every sin once for all. Which means now, before you sin, while you sin, and after you sin you're forgiven. Well, brother, I didn't repent yet. 
you're forgiven. You disconnect yourself from relationship when you sin. You step away, you push away in the same way that when you sin against your brother, you disconnect relationship. But he can still forgive you even before you've been reconciled. So God, who's reconciled the whole world onto himself, 2 Corinthians 5, has now the message of the ambassadors is to preach a message of reconciliation. Since all have been reconciled unto God, now our message that we preach that we're compelled by love is to persuade men, be reconciled unto God. Because God through this sacrifice and this new covenant that he sets up with Jesus, this new covenant is a new covenant of forgiveness, where God is now saying, you're forgiven. You are forgiven. But now the issue is, have you come into relationship? Have you turned away from what you are walking in and turned toward relationship? So now the issue is not when I feel bad and I show up at church, and I kneel at the altar going, God, will you forgive me today? He already forgave you. He forgave you before you were born. He forgave you 2,000 years ago when the forgiveness was done once for all. So there's a theological thing out there that says that Jesus only died for a limited atonement, that he didn't die for all sin. Except, it says in 1 John 2, 2, he died not for our sins only, but for the sins of the entire world. So, that means God the Father has forgiven the entire world. But hell will still be filled with people that God forgave. Just because he forgave them does not mean that they have all turned to him and been reconciled. See, our, our message has been off, and we've been mixing our covenants together and, and teaching people a misunderstanding. If we can understand this new covenant is that the God the Father and God the Son, they created a new covenant. And now the question is, do you want the forgiveness that's already been given to you? God loves you. He's forgiven you. He's like the father of the prodigal son. He is the father that is waiting for you to come home. He's not the father who's saying, come home and apologize, and then I'll forgive you. And that's how we've displayed him. That's how we've demonstrated. We've said, well, you know, if you come home and you maybe if you cry and you feel bad enough, then he'll forgive you. You can feel better about your repentance knowing you cried. Because then maybe it, it'll stick. A part of the problem, though, is you get in here and you start to apologize to him every single Sunday. Lord, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. We need a revelation. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. So stay in relationship with him. You're loved, you're forgiven. Stay on the farm with the Father. Don't run out and be the prodigal again. Don't you know who you are? Don't you know how much He loves you? He, he already gave everything He could. He's already given the forgiveness. It's already there. This, this, this shakes a lot of foundational stuff. So when Jesus shows up, he's called the son of Abraham. He's called the son of David. See, those promises, those grant promises, Jesus walked them out and he fulfilled them. That's why in Galatians 3, it speaks of the Abrahamic covenant and it says, and he said to Abraham, not to your seeds, but to your seed, I make this promise. And he says in Galatians 3.16, he applies the promise to Abraham was fulfilled by being given to Jesus. So Abraham was given a promise, and that promise was Jesus. David was given a promise. And I know so often we, 
we read Acts 2 only as if it's about the day of Pentecost. But there was something going on there that a lot of us haven't seen. Actually, why don't you turn there with me? I want you to see it right in your own Bible so you can find it again. But Acts chapter 2 is about covenant fulfillment. So Acts chapter 2 begins with the day of Pentecost. Then Peter addresses the crowd. He talks about in the last days. And usually, right after that quote is where we stop. But if you keep reading, Peter's still talking. Most of us have walked out mid-sermon. But Peter's still talking. And so you get down to verse 29. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died. That's a good observation, Peter. I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David is dead and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a, a prophet and knew that God had promised him an oath. Well, that was the covenant. Oath is another word for covenant. He had promised him an oath, that he would place one of his descendants on the throne, seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, and he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, Lord, said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, here's the punch of the sermon. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. He's saying the fact that Jesus was resurrected and put on a throne next to God, an eternal throne that he will sit on for all eternity as he sits at the right hand of God and all his enemies are made his footstool, that right there, that picture, is the fulfillment of what God had said to David in 2 Samuel 7, I will put one of your descendants on an eternal throne. That's as big a deal to the listeners as in the last days I'll pour out the Spirit on all flesh. This is the Jesus is now the king we've been waiting for. We've been waiting since David got that word from the Lord for a king to sit on a throne and be our eternal king. Who will be that king? And they're hoping for some rebel to rise up against Rome and they're so nearsighted and they're not understanding. This is about a king that is the son of God and is God, and he will reign on a throne as all of his enemies are made his footstool. This is global, this is eternal, this is big picture, and they don't get it. And they're so short-sighted that they're missing it. And Peter's saying, I tell you this confidently, let all Israel know he's made him both the Lord and he's the Messiah. This is huge but he still has to do something about this Moses covenant. This Moses covenant is still hanging around. As 2 Corinthians chapter 3 talks about it, the ministry of death written on stone tablets, a fading glory, that those who hear it still to this day when he's talking, they don't hear Jesus because a veil is over their eyes. But when they turn to Jesus, the veil is taken away. And the glory of this new covenant is brought. The old covenant is obsolete. It says in Hebrews 8, chapter 13, or chapter 8, verse 13, that which is called old is obsolete, outdated, and soon to fade away. That is one of the most interesting verses, I think, in the whole New Testament. Because referring to the old covenant, it's been made obsolete and outdated and it's fading away as the writer of Hebrews is writing this down. In the first century, he's saying what Jesus did at the cross struck 
a new covenant with God. And that new covenant with God is here, and it, in, it made the old one obsolete, completely invalidated it. Now that the old one is invalid, it's fading away. Now the old covenant was completely removed when the temple was destroyed by the Roman invasion, invasion of Jerusalem. That was the fading away, and then it totally faded away. In fact, an interesting point about that was when the Romans came in and they destroyed the temple, they actually destroyed all of the genealogical records, which is interesting because if only Levites can be priests, you don't know who a Levite is anymore. There's absolutely no way to reset up the old covenant. It is impossible. It is impossible. You could not set up a temple system no matter how hard you tried, no matter how many red cows you found, no matter how many you know, people put together some purple robes and you know, all that stuff that people talk about, you know, the rebuilding of the temple. It's impossible to recreate the old covenant system because the genealogical records were entirely destroyed at the destruction of Jerusalem. They cannot reestablish it. That was the destruction, final destruction, of the old temple system. Does anybody know what year did that take place? It happened in 70 AD. In 70 AD, the reason it happened in 70 AD and not in 57 or in, in 85, think about this. How many years did they wander in the wilderness after the Exodus? 40, that's right. From 30 AD, which is when Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected. He was born in 3 BC. He ministered from 27 to 30. From 30 AD, when Jesus died on the cross, a new Exodus was established where the church was leaving the old covenant system and stepping into the new covenant. There was a transition going on. And for a lot of us, we still haven't left the old covenant. It's been 2,000 years. And we need to leave the old covenant system. Do not be a part of the generation that still walks with a mindset of as if you came out of Egypt. A slavery mindset that just needs to die off in the wilderness be replaced by a new generation. That stuff has to go. The legalism, the restrictions, the, the, all this stuff that people try to pull in, that they say, well, you know, but in Leviticus it says, you know, you can't have a tattoo. It also says stone your child when they are rebellious. You can't, you can't pick and choose. James says you have to fulfill the whole thing, and if you fail at even one part, it's like you broke the whole thing. You can't pick and choose. And people are still trying to pick and choose their way through. We don't throw out the Old Testament. We throw out the bondwoman and her son. We throw out Ishmael. We throw out that thing. And it's, it's amazing the picture that, that Paul draws in Galatians 3. I just want to read it to you. In Galatians 3, starting in verse 15, he says, uh, starting in verse 17, what I mean is this, the law introduced 430 years later did not set aside the covenant previously established by God and do away with the promise. So uh, what am I looking for? That is not the passage I'm looking for. There's so much in chapter 4 and chapter 3. Here it is. The beginning of chapter 4. What I am saying is this, that as long as the heir is under age, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were under age, 
we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. He's saying this, the law was like a a schoolmaster that watched over you as Israel was was growing up the law was there to keep them in check it was some rules it was a little bit of regulations it was a guardian who watched over them as they were raised up but when they come a full age they are no longer under that guardian now they're a free son now they become an heir Now they become, as a free man, they are a son, no longer one that just lives under this restriction of the law. What I want you to get to understand here is that what Jesus did by establishing a new covenant provided complete forgiveness for you. It provided forgiveness. See, it's not freedom from rules. It's freedom from bondage. And bondage can be rules or it can be a life of sin. Those are both bondage. Jesus says in John 8, he who sins is a slave to sin. The law is not the only thing that will make you a slave, but it will make you a slave. The other thing that will make you a slave is walking in sin. The freedom that God gave to us is freedom that you are self-controlled. You've been given your life back. You used to be under the control of the law, under the control of the restrictions, under the control of the devil, under the control of addictions, under control of alcohol and drugs and sex and whatever else used to have you in bondage. And when God came in, he didn't just say, now I'll control you. See, he wanted you to be self-controlled. He wanted to give you freedom to be able to tell yourself yes and no. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control. God gave you back the reins and said, I want to partner with you as my covenant partner. God is not honored by marrying down. God is looking to be equally yoked. God is not looking for a trailer park bride that he can control. This is not some sort of spiritually uh, religious abusive relationship where he's just looking to control you. He's looking for someone who can stand and look him eye to eye. So if he says to us, don't be unequally yoked, he himself is not going to have his son marry down. It doesn't honor him. He wants a bride who can stand beautiful and radiant, that can stand confident and free, that can stand knowing her identity, knowing who she is, the glory that she carries, and that she can... See, you don't need your own covenant because you're supposed to be one with him. And he has a covenant with the Father. You become two, become one. This is the mystery of Ephesians 5 where Paul says, I speak to you as a mystery that the Christ and the church, the two have become one. I don't hear the songs here, and I love that I don't. But there are so many places that the songs talk about a lovesick bride and, you know, I pine for heaven and someday when I will be one with him. You're meant to be one with him now. That's who you are. And that is how he sees you. So the issue now of, well, you know, but 
But back here, it was, it was blessings versus cursings. You know, back in this section, I read the Old Covenant. I read the Old Testament. I saw blessings and cursings. Jesus became a curse for you. All those who hang on a tree are accursed. He became a curse for you, and he took that away. Well, but back here, there's people who get sicknesses and diseases. Jesus died, and by his stripes, you had healing purchased for you. See, Jesus bought the benefits package. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but when you look at the Old Testament picture of the Day of Atonement, which is the day that Jesus died, the Old Testament picture was a sheep that had its throat slit. And the throat being slit and the blood being shed, the nation was forgiven for another year. Jesus could have had his throat slit and we would have been forgiven. But it wouldn't have made us new creation. It wouldn't have released grace. It would have released mercy. You would have been forgiven, but nothing about your life would have changed. Well, God forgave me. That's great. I still have no power over sin, and nothing else has really changed other than, I guess, he's not angry at me. And that's what it was. Even when you read in the book of Hebrews, it says that the people, although they had been forgiven, they still had a guilty conscience. The, the Old Testament system didn't cleanse even their conscience from feeling guilty about what they did. They knew they were forgiven, and they still felt like garbage. But now he says he sprinkles his blood on the mercy seat so you're forgiven, and he sprinkles his blood on your conscience to wipe it clean of all guilt and no condemnation in Christ. This new covenant, why was he beaten? He didn't need to be beaten because of the shadow. They never took those cute little sheep and just whipped them and spit on them and shamed them and said, who punched you, sheep? They didn't do that. Why did he get to go through all of that stuff? Because by his stripes were healed. Those sheep dying didn't heal anyone. So he went an extra mile to buy your purchase, purchase your healing. He goes another mile. It says that, that our shame was put on him. He took on shame so you could be shame free. He took, he took everything that he did was to purchase you another piece of this, this whole new covenant. And then he goes even a little further. Not only, not only do you receive, you see this word inheritance all over the New Testament. God gave you an inheritance. What is this inheritance thing about? Jesus is given an inheritance. Jesus then dies. He leaves you in the will. Here's all this awesome stuff that you inherit. Then why does he come back? To make sure you got everything. See, most people, if you raised them from the dead, they'd say, hey, I'm going to need my clothes, my car, my house. I'm going to need that stuff because I'm back from the dead. Jesus comes back from the dead to create a new creation. See, he died to deal with who you were. He was resurrected so that you'd be united with him in his life. You become something new. Him coming out of the grave released grace it released a new creation a new creation was released into the world you are that new creation see when we pray for the sick it's not just about let me demonstrate the kingdom of god it's also a demonstration of your covenant with god it's also you saying you don't understand you shouldn't be sick because you're completely forgiven you're completely loved. You're the bride that was worth dying for. This sickness was paid for. There's just absolutely no reason you should have this. It's, in our mind, it's kind of like we've, we've narrowed it down to, well, Jesus is bigger than the devil, so you should get healed. Well, that's true, I guess. You know, that's true. But that's not the point. It's not a power struggle between God and the devil. It's you understanding your rights and your inheritance. Going, this is in my covenant. Be healed. 
It's in my covenant not to have demons inside you or me. It's in my covenant. Jesus doesn't have demons. I'm one with him. You shouldn't have demons. I shouldn't have demons. I shouldn't be tormented. You shouldn't be tormented. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, and I'm in him. Far above all principalities and powers, rulers of the darkness of this age. To fight for victory means you don't know you're standing with God. We fight from victory. He already got victory. You stand in it. And how do you fight? By standing. And having done all to stand, stand. How do you fight the devil? Resist. He runs away. See, people read Ephesians 6 and they're a little confused because they think it means I have to get into some battle to try to get victory. He says we wrestle not, and then he tells you to put on the whole armor of God, and that word put as in duo, it means to sink into. Sink into the full armor of God. Just sink into it. And now that you've sunk into it, stand. And having done all the stand, Stand. You get to know who you are, the covenant you have with God, the kingdom that you represent, and you stand there. And as you stand, that's you resisting. And he has to flee. See this? Let me give you the overarching vision here. There's a lot of people that are still waiting for some day Jesus to come in his rescue helicopter and get his bride who is just totally beaten up and has dwindled down to just a couple good churches that he's going to rescue. But that's not the mission he left us with. See, this word apostle that he uses when he refers to his team, he calls them apostles, was a well-known term in its day. It comes from this word apostolos. The concept of an apostolos was that Rome had realized, we keep taking over these other countries and these other cities and regions, but the people end up going back to their own ways and they rebel and they, they don't stay a part of the kingdom and it's disjointed. So the, what they began to do was they would send a special envoy to that town. That, that, it was a ship called the Apostolos. And when the Apostolos came to that town, it was not a warship. This was after the battle had been won. So Jesus has won the battle, and he's sent out his apostles on an Apostolos mission to make disciples of all nations, to spread the gospel of the kingdom to all nations, to preach these good tidings. So he sent them out on the Apostolos mission. The Apostolos ship sent from Rome was filled with artists and musicians and writers and philosophers and teachers and scientists. It was filled with cultures, culturizers, people that would bring culture of Rome to that conquered land. Paul speaks of us as ambassadors. He speaks of us as citizens of heaven. You're a citizen. It, it, let me give you this picture this way, okay? I'm going to come back to the apostolos in a moment, and I'm coming in for a landing. If we were to think of it as two different pictures, there's planet fear and planet love. Planet Earth is planet fear. The atmosphere of this planet is fear. It manifests in so many different ways, pride and arrogance and power struggles and wars and control and all these systems that people operate in. You live on planet fear, but you're an ambassador sent from planet love. So your citizenship is planet love, and you're sent as an ambassador into planet fear, and love casts out fear. 
So you got this space suit on, and it has an umbilical cord that goes up to planet love. And you're down here on planet fear, and your job is to cast out all fear from this planet. But a lot of what happens is we put a kink in our air hose. And the love stops flowing in. And we get motivated by all kinds of different fears and insecurities to the point that we think that the God of planet love that sent us is angry at us. And we become afraid of the one we're supposed to be an ambassador of. And he's like, are you kidding? I sent you there. I am the God of love. I did everything to create a new covenant between the Son and myself so they can't screw it up. It will never be a problem. Uh, they're completely forgiven, absolutely reconciled. Your message, go down there. Be compelled by love. Go down there and try to persuade to be reconciled to me. And we kink our air hose. And we become acclimated to this. And we become detached. And when we talk about an encounter with God, it's like, oh, I need a big encounter with God. Let your air hose work again. Unkink that thing. Because that love is just going to... And it'll start in you, and it will become impacting to everybody around you. And they begin to feel it. And you can walk through a canning factory, and people will cry and weep because of the presence that you carry. You can walk into places, and they just sense it. It's, it's not about, well, I, you know, I'm called as an evangelist. People will come running. Simon the sorcerer said, Peter, I'll, I'll give you money for what you're walking in. Peter would walk down the street and his shadow would heal people. Paul had a venomous serpent bite his hand and he holds it over the fire till it burns and falls off of his hand and everybody gets saved. So this stuff is not a revival. It's just what should be normal for us when our air hose is working. Your spacesuit is not broken. It's just a kink in the air hose. And I'm saying open up your heart again and let that love flow in. Be that ambassador into this world. The point of the apostolos was to culturize this new land. They would to come in and they'd bring the music of Rome. They'd bring the writing, the literature. They would bring the culture of Rome into that new land and culturize it to the point that if the emperor ever were to come visit, he could come and visit this land and say, this feels a lot like Rome. Are we waiting for a rescue helicopter? No. Jesus is waiting for us. We're not waiting for him. He's waiting for you. And what is he waiting for? He's waiting for earth to be culturized with heaven. He's waiting for planet love to impact planet fear. He's waiting for that to be what takes over. See, that is where we're headed. That is the direction we are going in, the culturizing of heaven into the earth, that the earth would be culturized with heaven, that love would cast out fear. But if you do not understand your new covenant with God, you kink your own air hose and think that the one who sent you as an ambassador of reconciliation is someone that you have to be afraid of and maybe you need to be reconciled with. If you're here tonight and you don't know the Lord personally and directly and you want to step into Jesus and be a part of that new covenant where you're forgiven, knowing that you're forgiven, you're cleansed, your conscience, your guilt, all of that's absolutely washed away, Yes, we can do that tonight. You can come into a revelation of that love that he has for you, that new covenant. But even beyond just that piece of it, every piece of this is available tonight. See, so often we say, you know, we need a demonstration of power. We need a demonstration of the kingdom. I want a demonstration of the new covenant. 
even if you already have have understood this to a degree i i want a revelation to settle into every heart and every mind that you are forgiven you are loved he has done everything to establish a a new covenant with you and his goal is that you come into that open heart relationship whether you've walked with him for 50 years or 50 seconds it's an open-hearted relationship it is the stripes that heal it's all the healing you need to come into your body all of the things he purchased are available today let's stand we're going to do an impartation on yourself right now take one hand and put it on your head Agree in your heart as I pray here. Lord, I just receive all of the blessing that you purchased for me. I receive your healing in my body. I receive the freedom from bondage in my body, in my mind, in my soul, in my heart. I receive that freedom. I am not called to struggle. I'm not called to fight this demonic oppression for the rest of my life. I'm called to rule and to reign, to be set free, to be the head and not the tail. I speak that blessing of impartation over every person right now. I speak healing into your body. I speak forgiveness. You are forgiven. I don't care what you did. I don't care when you did it. I don't care if you're doing it right now. You are forgiven. Be reconciled unto God. Turn back to the Father that loves you and has provided forgiveness. Turn away from sin that keeps you in bondage and turn back to the forgiving Father. Come home, prodigal son. Come home to the Father that loves you. Why just speak worth and value over every son and over every daughter here. No matter your age, you are a son and you are a daughter You are the bride. You are much loved. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. And you are forgiven. And your conscience is cleansed by his blood. No longer do you need to walk under a cloud of guilt. You are free. you just take the hand of a a person nearby you right now let's just everybody take a hand Lord I I, as I've just prayed as as individuals I pray as a corporate body and we just praying corporately right now we we say yes to your call to bring love into this earth to be those who who represent you who bring love into planet fear, that, Lord, we would be those who carry this message, that carry a message of love and reconciliation. I thank you for this this body. I thank you that, Lord, your bride is going to step up into our identity and be glorious without spot or wrinkle, as your word says. A glorious bride without spot or wrinkle. Lord, I ask for a revelation of identity to rest on them. Lord, I thank you that the new covenant is a grant covenant. Thank you, Father, for the grant covenant that we've been given. Thank you for the inheritance we've been given. As your ambassadors, we thank you for the message we get to carry to the world. I bless your people in Jesus' name. That's awesome, man. Jonathan, he wrecks my world every time, every single time. Again, if you haven't gotten any of his books, there are products that are available out there. 
Uh, it's just awesome, awesome, just reading the revelation that he has. He's a deep well to drink from. He'll be back with us on Sunday morning here uh, at the 1115 service. If you would like to dip back in tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock, uh, just a great time. Looking forward to that. Josh Clayton will be speaking for us tomorrow afternoon. Uh, we'll do what we do, and worship will actually be a panel of where there's some uh, questionnaires and different things that will be taking place. And then you're stuck with me closing it out tomorrow night. So we invite you to come back all day tomorrow. It's going to be a crazy, crazy day. So love on about 10 people before you leave tonight. God bless you. Have a great one.